Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the EOL seminar series. This is the last seminar of 2021, and we're pulling out all the stops with an exciting topic and speaker to close out this year. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Armin Sarushian, who is a professor at the Department of Chemical and Environmental Engineering at the University of Arizona. Armin's education revolved around chemical engineering from his bachelor's to master's and PhD, both of those degrees he received at Caltech. Armin is no stranger to Colorado, which is where he did his postdoc at Colorado State University and NOAA. That further cemented his research interest and focus in the atmospheric sciences realm. Dr. Sarushian has an active service record. He is on the editorial boards of a number of atmospheric journals. He is on the board of director, directors at the American Institute of Chemical Engineers Environmental Division, and he is on the American Association for Aerosol Research Awards Committee. In recent years, Dr. Sarushian has received the AGU Atmospheric Sciences Ascent Award and the Da Vinci Circle Fellowship at the University of Arizona's College of Engineering. His talk today is titled Smoke, Ships, Dust, Salt, and Other Features Interacting with Clouds, Findings from Recent Field Campaigns. The flavor of this seminar covers a breadth of topics, including biomass burning, atmospheric chemistry, clouds, and aerosol that all fall under the air quality umbrella. We are using Slido to post questions, which you can ask at any time during the seminar. The Slido window is located below this presentation screen. Do not panic if you do not see your question pop up because we are archiving all questions until close to the end of the speaker's presentation where they will be revealed during the Q&A portion of the talk. Dr. Armin Sarushian, we welcome you to NCAR and EOL and the virtual stage is now yours. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I uh, wanted to see if I can start my video. There we go. Um, thank you everyone uh, for attending and I want to first thank the organizers for inviting me. It's an honor to be presenting um, and I hopefully we have a good one for the last one of the uh, year. So um, I wanted to show this nice photo. Um, it kind of captures what I busy myself with most summers when it comes to research. It's a photo I took from the back of the uh, Surpass Twin Otter aircraft, which is the uh, platform that I've used most for my research um, since I began as a graduate student. And this is a photo right off the coast of California um, after taking off from the city of Marina. And uh, it captures a nice picture of these low boundary layer clouds that um, I'm so interested in. So let's begin. Um, I first want to begin with my acknowledgments uh, rather than end with them. Uh, the research that I'll be presenting um, in the next uh, 45, 50 minutes or so has largely been funded by NASA and the Office of Naval Research. And these wonderful people are the ones that I've had the honor to uh, advise over the 12 years I've been a faculty member. So these are my graduated master's and PhD students here. So it's largely their work that I'll be uh, showing off. and. These are the current group members I have in my group. So the most recent uh, work that I'll show from the Activate campaign is largely from um, the, the fruits of their uh, research. So uh, in terms of the roadmap for the talk, I, I wanna begin with a, an early golden flight in 2004 that set me on a trajectory to get interested in clouds and their interactions with aerosol particles. Then I'll transition to the coastal California uh, research that I've done with the Twin Otter. And then finally, I'll transition to the opposite coast of the US where uh, I've been very busy in recent years with uh, the NASA Activate Airborne Field Campaign. And interestingly enough, at the very end, I'm gonna tie things back into this early golden flight. So with that, let's begin with that golden flight. And this is from the ICART uh, field campaign that maybe many of you in the audience were involved in uh, with some capacity. And uh, I was involved, of course, with the Twin Otter aircraft. We were based in Cleveland, Ohio. And this campaign took place about a few weeks after I passed my PhD qualifier exam. So I kind of showed up to the field with a couple new instruments that were somewhat foreign to me. And I had to kind of figure it out quickly. And I'm sure glad I figured it out before our fifth research flight because it, it was a really good one. 
So we uh, did a lot of sampling around this Conesville power plant, which is south of Cleveland, Ohio. And we got the opportunity to study how the plume interacted with the clouds. And uh, the results, as I, I didn't appreciate it at the, at the, when I first collected them, but later as I read the literature, and I developed a, a greater appreciation for what the results were showing. Um, so this is just a basic time series of um, some species measured by the instrument called the particle into liquid sampler, which is an instrument that samples particles, grows them into droplets, collects them by inertial impaction. Then we collect those, uh, the collected liquid and vials on a rotating carousel that we analyze after flight with ion chromatography. So what's interesting is you can see the red and green traces follow each other very well. Red is sulfate, and uh, down here I've got the chemical structure. And in green is uh, the anion of oxalic acid, which is the smallest dicarboxylic acid. These two species, uh, you can just look at what, what they look like. They don't have the same precursors. So the question was, what is the link between these two? And the answer after investigating more and more uh, came to be that they have a common production medium, which is the aqueous phase. Um, specifically in clouds. It was, it's well known that sulfate is uh, produced um, efficiently in clouds, but at that time there was less known about organics and how they can be produced in the aqueous phase. And so this was a really nice flight to show that uh, cloud processing is a very significant source for some secondary organic aerosol species like these organic acids. And so this is a very intimidating figure with a lot of organic chemistry, but the punchline is, is when all these various uh, volatile organic carbon species get into the aqueous phase and end product of all this chemistry can be oxalic acid, which is why it's the most abundant um, organic acid in tropospheric aerosol particles. So anyways, that was kind of how things started for me in terms of getting interested in clouds and their interactions with particles. So this has largely been the system of interest uh, in my research. Uh, you can see there's quite a lot of things going on, and I'm not going to go into great detail on this slide about what everything is, but um, uh, something that maybe you can appreciate is, and you likely already know this, is it's a very complex system with multiple feedbacks and things are connected to one another. And it's not as easy as saying one wants to study how aerosols affect clouds because clouds themselves affect aerosols through a number of important processes, one of which I already talked about which is cloud processing, where the composition and size of a particle will be different after it became a droplet as compared to before it was activated into a droplet. So the cup, there's also coupling between these two directions of aerosol effects on clouds and how clouds affect aerosol. So anyways, uh, this is kind of a, a nice little introduction to the system. And now I'm gonna get into the specifics of some of the work we've done off the coast of California over the last 15 years or so with the Twin Otter. And there's been a lot of research done in this region. It's, it's quite popular for aerosol cloud research because one, there's always a persistent stratocumulus deck off the coast of California. And it's a very accessible region because of um, hangars like the Surpass Hangar by Marina. And stratocumulus clouds themselves are very important because it's the dominant cloud type by global area and they have an important impact on climate because they're very reflective they have a very high albedo and this region also has a lot of ship traffic so it makes it a little bit easier to study aerosol cloud interactions because there's very strong perturbations in terms of aerosol emissions from these ships so this on the left is kind of a snapshot of all the various campaigns that have taken place with the Twin Otter that I've been involved with since um, dating back to when I was a graduate student. There's the MACE-1 campaign in 2005, and uh, one of the more recent campaigns was Monarch in 2019. So you can see the flight tracks are pretty um, uh, saturated over this little dash box area, which is where it's most accessible to the hangar. These are about four hour flights that we do out and back. The typical flight strategy that we use, I'll show on the top right with this little cartoon. With the Twin Otter, we fly below, in, and above a cloud because, again, we, to understand the aerosol cloud system, we kind of need to know what's going on in the column, which includes what's below, in, and above the actual clouds. And we also do spiral soundings as well before and after these sorts of wall patterns. So over the years, we've done quite a lot of flights, lots of flight data, you know, over 660 flight hours worth. 
And we took it upon ourselves, my group and I, to do kind of something that, you know, other uh, major teams do, like with NASA and NOAA, where we publicly archive the field data. This, there was no formal mechanism to do this with the Surpass Twin Honor. So my group actually spent a couple of years to do very careful QA, QC of this data, which is not easy to do, as, as some of you know who've done this with field data with, uh, with aircraft. Um, so we, we actually posted all this data. It's publicly available on the FigShare repository site. And we wrote a little data descriptor paper to go over all of the data. And this BAMS paper kind of gives a very high level summary of some of the, the findings that we've, we've obtained from all this, these great flights we've done. So what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is show some selected things that we've done um, from all those campaigns. And uh, some of these things date back to, as you can see here, about a decade ago, but they kind of build into a story that I'm, I'm going to talk about leading to the importance of giant particles, especially sea salt. So beginning with the EPs campaign, um, if, you've, if you're not aware of it, it's you know, back in the day, you know, we'd want to go out there with the aircraft and find these large cargo and tanker ships, um, which is a little bit of a challenge sometimes. So the idea of EPs was what if we have our own ship where we can have our own aerosol emissions to make it easier for the Twin Otter to find the plume and then fly in the clouds to see how they were perturbed by the aerosol emissions. So this is the Point Sur research vessel. And we uh, obtained these types of smoke generators off of eBay for on the order of about $100 a pop. And then we had these jugs of oil donated to us. And this is a picture of the basically evaporating that oil and making a smoke plume that the idea was it would go up into the, the marine boundary layer clouds. So this is uh, me. I'm the flight scientist on the Twin Otter here with two Navy pilots in the front flying the plane. This is a picture my student took from the ship. So again, the idea is we come with the plane and sort of chase this plume and see how the clouds are being perturbed by these emissions. So we had a two week cruise and um, I just wanna focus in on one of the days uh, from that cruise uh, where an actual ship track was formed. Um, uh, so I'm gonna zoom in here on this little yellow box right by Monterey Bay. And so this is the track of the ship for six plus hours that day where the smoke was being emitted. And if you extrapolate where this plume would be later in the day where the satellite image, uh, when the satellite image was taken using wind data, you can see it nicely matches um, where the bright lines are of the cloud. So this is sort of classic Tumi effect taking place where, um, where if you have a lot of pollution that's interacting with the cloud, you know, at fixed liquid water, more you get more but smaller droplets, and this leads to a more reflective cloud. Uh, so um, for the other days of this cruise, we could not, uh, this was not, um, an, uh, we, we didn't brighten any clouds because of all, a host of challenges, like there's multiple cloud layers, or the smoke was not buoyant enough to get into the cloud. Um, and uh, there's other reasons you didn't, we didn't make um, these types of ship tracks. And so that was actually a question we had. Why on some days do you see ship tracks and sometimes you don't in the satellite imagery? So here's just an example of two days. On the right, you can see the ship tracks, these nice bright uh, lines. And on this day, you don't really see them very easily or at all. The ships are there and the clouds are there. So why don't you see them? So uh, as I sat in the back of the Twin Otter and many of these campaigns, including EPs, I sort of have a lot of time to brainstorm about what's new and great that we can do with this aircraft that um, we can test some new hypothesis. So I thought to myself, well, we fly right behind a lot of these ships. And so what if we start from about 50 meters above the water, which is as low as we can usually go with the Twin Otter and just spiral up to above the cloud top into the free troposphere and then hop to the side in an unperturbed area and spiral back down. And then just compare the data to see if we can learn anything about why you make ship tracks and you don't on some occasions. So on four flights, um, as shown here, we did this. Um, so these rows of data correspond to the clean spiral and then the ship perturbed spiral. And uh, an important column of data is the cloud albedo. The higher this is, the more reflective the cloud is. And so you can see here that as research flight 20 is really the only one where we clearly saw, you know, what one would normally expect from the Tumi effect, where the more polluted cloud is a lot more reflective. The question is what happened in the other three flights? And so one thing that we easily saw from our data analysis is that maybe the mesoscale cloud structure matters. 
Research Flight 20 was the only one that looked more like this situation on the right with more open cell behavior. The other days were more of an overclass cloud type of situation. So, um, and I wanna sort of uh, pay credit to my, my uh, uh, postdoc mentor when I was at NOAA, Graham Feingold, who's still a mentor of mine. And he always uh, introduced uh, me to this nice little analogy of a bowl of miso soup where you get these patterns of cells from Bernard convection. Um, so anyways, I wanna probe a little bit more into those other three flights that had more of a close, close cell situation to see what differences existed. And so I, I box up now those three flights. And there's actually one flight where you did see a, we did see a little bit of an enhancement where the ship was in the red box. The question is what's different about the other two flights where um, there was actually a reduction in albedo where the ship, ship plume was. And a parameter that's important here is the dew point depression, which is the difference between temperature and the dew point temperature above cloud top. And what this gets at is the warmer and drier the air is above the cloud top, where, when, wherever you have the ship plume, you might actually get a reduction in albedo. So not, not only does the mesoscale cloud structure matter, but the free tropospheric humidity and temperature matters. And so we concluded with this flow chart that kind of describes the competition between different things as to whether you get the brightening or not. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna walk through it really briefly. Um, so with an increase in aerosol, which is when you have the ship plume, you ideally should get a larger drop concentration. And this leads to smaller drop effective radius, which is sort of the classic Tumia effect where you get a brighter cloud. Again, at fixed liquid water. But if you have smaller droplets, this leads to less uh, drop sedimentation. Um, and that means you probably have less drizzle, which serves to sort of preserve the water in the cloud. So you, you might actually get an enhancement in liquid water paths and cloud thickness. This leads to also an increase in albedo, which leads to the cooling effect. But if you have reduction in drop sedimentation and less drizzle, you might actually get more cloud top evaporation, which through a chain of events leads to more turbulence and you can have entrainment. And if that air that you're entraining is dry and warm, this serves to sort of dissipate the cloud, remove, reduce the liquid water and the cloud thickness. And this actually is, leads to the reduction in the albedo that we saw on those closed cell uh, days. And so we did a lot of satellite data analysis too. And whenever there are these closed cell structures, you know, a third of the time we see a reduction in albedo where the ship plumes are. So that was an interesting project. Um, but one more thing that I actually thought about with these ships, you know, there's so much focus on the Tumi effect and uh, ship track formation. But um, as I fly behind these ships, it's, it's really hard to ignore the fact that there's a large wake generated behind these ships. You know, the waves are breaking, which leads to sea salt emissions. And sea salt is known to be a giant hygroscopic nuclei, otherwise known as a giant CCN, CCN being cloud condensation nuclei. So, uh, you know, there's this early study in the 1930s done where this might be arguably one of the first studies to talk about the impact of giant CCN on warm clouds and rain formation. The presence of just a few of these sea salt particles can actually lead to, um, uh, it can expedite the, the process of producing warm rain in clouds. So it actually does things that are opposite to the classic Tumi effect. Uh, it's still a big question around, you know, the nature of these giant CCN effects on the clouds. I got very interested in this, so I had a few questions to answer with our field uh, projects. One is, are ships themselves a source of giant CCN? Two, uh, with all the field work we do, uh, what are some good proxy measurements for giant CCN? And if we can show that we do have some good proxy measurements, the third question is, can data analysis sort of reproduce what model simulation studies show in terms of how these giant CCN affect clouds. So with that, um, I also wanted to introduce this, this excerpt from the, one of the, uh, the latter parts of a really important paper that Graham Feingold wrote in 99 about giant CCN. I underline the sentence, which is, um, he proposed this counter hypothesis that even small concentrations of giant CCN can impact ship tracks by enhancing collection and reducing albedo. So again, this is exactly what I'm, I, I'm interested in uh, trying to answer with our field data. So although we've studied a lot more ships than this, this is, these are just some selected ships where I, I, uh, 
uh, determined we collected our best data to do this type of analysis. This is the type of flight track we've done with the twin honor behind ships where we come up right behind them. And then we do sort of these racetrack patterns where we fly right behind the plume and then fly in a control area back to, uh, downwind and then come right back up to the ship and so forth. And we've also done zigzag patterns. So we're collecting a lot of data in the plume and in the control areas. And I basically use data from a, 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 one of the wing optical probes, the CAS, which can look at dry diameters of, of particles between 0.6 and 60 micron. And so I just looked at a very simple ratio. What is the number of concentration above these different three uh, minimum diameter thresholds? Um, what's the ratio behind the ship versus the control areas? And of course, the ratios um, uh, are above unity. Um, so there's a significant enhancement in the number of these giant particles uh, behind these ships. And the amount of enhancement increases as the minimum size threshold goes up. So we answered the first question. Ships indeed are a source of, of giant CCN. In this work, we didn't actually address how the clouds responded to these, um, these emissions. But for that, we did some other type of work during the EPS campaign, which is um, salt delivery using this uh, fluidized bed delivery system that Hoff Johnson, who's now retired um, at Surpass, he uh, developed. And so we did some seating experiments on some flights. And this is just an example of one, one of the flights on August 3rd, where um, right at the sort of right below cloud top in a cloud deck between points E and F here, and my, if you can see my cursor, it's also the middle panel here. We did the salt release. And then after the salt release, what we did is we came back to the same sort of area and did a cloud wall pattern to see how did the cloud properties change after the seeding as compared to before the seeding. As is the case with all these types of modification studies, it's really hard to know if the change that maybe you saw is due to the uh, aerosol release or some just natural evolution of the system. So with that caveat in mind, let's just still look at the data and what it showed us. Um, so this is just a comparison of drop size distributions before and after the seeding. And after the seeding, you can see there's quite a bit of an enhancement in number of concentration for very large droplets, you know, greater than about, you know, 30 micron. So that's kind of consistent with how giant CCN are, are, are meant to expedite uh, uh, the broadening of the drop size distribution and lead to larger droplets that can drizzle. Here is a comparison of you know, before and after seeding of three key parameters. So blue markers are after seeding, yellow is before. And so this kind of represents what model studies typically show, which is with the giant CCN, you get larger effective diameters of droplets. As you can see, the blue markers are larger here. You get a reduction in drop concentration because again, there's uh, enhanced collision coalescence, which serves to make bigger droplets by combining them so you have fewer. And there was a, a significant enhancement in cloud-based precipitation rate um, after the seeding. So, with some calculations that have big error bars based on what we think was released by this fluidized bed delivery system, we saw that it doesn't take much to lead to this fourfold increase in cloud-based rainfall rate that we observed in this case flight. Now, an important point here is this often does not, this seeding will not work if you already have a pretty clean cloud that will drizzle anyway. So we, we did this in a number of other occasions, but those clouds were pretty darn clean. The reason we believe it was successful in this case flight is it was a pretty polluted cloud to begin with, which is when giant CCN effects we believe are, um, are more pronounced. So aside from the seeding, another question is, okay, what about just the natural marine atmosphere? What can we learn from just flights that we've done over the years without any of this, the sea salt release? Because the ocean itself, of course, is a massive source of, of sea salt particles that presumably are very large. So um, we, we looked at some different proxy measurements. I, I've already introduced the fact that we've used these wing probes like a CAS instrument to look at number of concentrations. So in this study led by my former student, now postdoc Hossein Dadeshazar, we looked at the number of concentration from the CAS above five micron in the lowest altitude leg we fly, which is typically about 50 meters above the ocean. And then we compared it to something new that we started to do a few years ago, which is cloud water chemical measurements. Specifically, we use chloride in this study. Chloride is the most abundant component of sea salt. 
So the question was, how well related are the cast measurements at 50 meters above the water below cloud and the cloud water chloride? Because the cloud water chloride really represents the joint CCN that activated into the droplets. And lo and behold, we did see a positive relationship. That was the hypothesis, but there's quite a bit of scatter. And that's not surprising based on all the things that can affect this relationship, because ultimately these, these giant particles down here need to get up into the cloud and get into the cloud water. And our cloud water probe needs to be able to sample them. So we did a little bit more digging and it turns out the relationship can improve when you look, when you bin the data in such a way that you look at it when there's reduced cloud-based rain rate and stronger vertical mixing, which are both factors that help get those um, uh, giant particles above the ocean, we think, to the cloud. So we felt like we had a good proxy measurement here from our cloud water chloride concentrations. Um, and that's a really good measurement to have because it's right in the clouds. Um, it's right there. So we did a little bit more analysis and um, these four figures don't, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but um, I'm gonna summarize in four bullets, the results of the detailed analysis we did. And what we did is we compared 12 pairs of cloud cases that had similar liquid water and drop concentrations, but had very different chloride concentrations, low and high. And what we saw was that the high chloride cases had um, larger concentration of the droplets above 20 micron. Um, so that's one thing that's sort of consistent with the literature. We see that the response of the uh, clouds to giant CCN is easier, is more pronounced in more polluted clouds. The giant CCN produced drops, we believe, precipitated before reaching cloud tops. And Interestingly enough, the, the, the data revealed negative precipitation susceptibilities. And this is a metric that was introduced some dozen years ago by Graham Feingold at the time when I was a postdoc working with him. And uh, what this does is it relates perturbations of, in drop number to rain rate. So a positive value indicates that for a fixed increase in drop number, you get a reduction in rain rate. But we see negative precipitation susceptibilities, which means that for an increase in aerosol, if you've got a lot of chloride around, um, you actually get more precipitation. And that's consistent with the giant CCN effects, where sea salt really does its best work when it's a polluted cloud already. So that's a little bit of what we've done with, uh, in the realm of the giant particles. It's still something we're interested in. Now, aside from ships and salt, one thing that's become unavoidable in recent summers is the fact that there's just wildfires everywhere um, that are affecting our study region. So we moved away from looking at things like ships to looking more at fire influence and interactions with clouds. It's just unavoidable now. And so we, we, we did a two-part paper series recently looking um, in part one at all the aerosol characteristics of these plumes. And so here in this cartoon are a few things we've looked at, like the thickness of these layers, is it multi-layer or single layer? What's the composition and size distribution in these smoke plumes? What's the distance from the cloud tops and so forth? And the part two study is looking at more of the cloud responses to these fire plumes. And so we've learned a lot from these measurements that we've conducted. It turns out these plumes hover right above cloud top. Um, often you have multiple layers and uh, they can be pretty thin layers but they're very strong in terms of high aerosol number concentration, especially above 100 nanometers. And these are very organic rich plumes as would be expected. Now in the next slide, I'm just gonna focus on selected results from the part two study, which is how the clouds are related to the smoke plumes. We are interested to know, you know it, what, are, what is the drop number of concentration in these, these perturbed clouds better related to? CCN number above the clouds or below the clouds? because the majority of the smoke particle number is above the cloud tops. But we know that activation of particles in the droplets is stronger at the, in the subcloud region. So what we learned from our data analysis is that indeed it's the subcloud CCN that are better related to the drop concentration. And so this is consistent with actually other findings from the Oracle's project in the Southeast Atlantic Ocean. The other thing we learned, which is really interesting from our cloud water uh, chemical measurements, and we, we sort of showed the same thing with surface uh, Moody measurements that we did in the city of Marina, is that whenever there's biomass burning interacting with clouds, we get strong signatures of dust species, including calcium, 
silicon. And we also see a significant amount of nitrate, which we believe is because of the nitric acid is so, so sticky, it likes to get onto the large surfaces, which is again, dust particles that we believe are being entrained into these smoke plumes due to the, the buoyancy and the turbulence of where the fires are starting. So um, those are some uh, tidbits um, uh, of things we've learned from our smoke studies. Another really interesting feature that we grew to appreciate in more recent summers um, off the California coast are these large cloud clearings you see here. And there's not been a lot done to study these. In fact, we found this one paper in the early 90s, which looked at them, but since then there's not really been much done. So we said, okay, why don't we go and try to study these with the Twin Otter? Um, because you know, understanding how these clearings work um, is important for just forecasting of weather and fog along the coastline, which is so important for industries like aviation and agriculture. And I should note that our work has shown that reanalysis data cannot reproduce the spatial location of these clearings as compared to satellite data, which indicates that there's probably subgrid processes taking place that upscale to these larger climatologically relevant sizes. So this is the type of thing we've done with the Twin Otter where we go find these large uh, clearings and we fly across the border between the cloudy part and the clear part. So we do these various level legs with the midpoint being right at the interface. And then we do spiral soundings on both sides of the column. Now I don't have um, enough time to get into all the details of our aircraft data analysis, which have been really rich, but I, I just wanted to highlight some things that we've learned from just satellite data analysis, like GOES imagery data. You can learn a lot by just staring at these images each day. So these clearings actually we learn have a life cycle. They have a multi-day life that in this case, during the NICE campaign, um, the clearings that we flew in, um, it was actually an 11 day event where during the day as shown in red, the clearings expand and then at night they contract. So there's an oscillation between growth and decay during the day. And also during the life cycle of the clearing, there's an oscillation between decay and then also growth. And on the right here, you can see how the centroid of the clearing moves uh, um, evolved uh, across 11 days. It started off the coast here of British Columbia and then moved down toward the, towards the central California region. And so at, at night, you can see how the clearing centroids move to the coast and then that day they move back to the west. So we did a couple of research flights during the sort of decay phase in research flight 16 and during the growth phase in research flight 19. So uh, uh, we also have looked at a decade's worth of these clearings um, for, with satellite data and we see that there are probably trigger points that lead to these clearings which are due to coastal topographical features. So we see that the trigger points are just south of Cape Blanco and Mendocino. That's where these things begin and then grow. And we've also seen the greatest growth, the acceleration of growth is between 9 a.m. and noon, typically. We did a lot of analysis to look at how has the number of clearings changed over time, over 10 years, and um, also what months are these clearings most common. So it's really during the summer months when they're more common. And then if you just look at the summer, there's not a lot anything convincing in terms of interannual trends. They just sort of are there. There's some natural variations year to year. We did a lot of uh, machine learning analysis to see how different parameters from satellite data and reanalysis are related to the growth rate of these clearings between 9 a.m. and noon, which is, again, that, those three hours of the greatest growth. And so here is just a summary bullets of what factors are, character, um, are common with when you see the greatest growth. You have this enhanced Pacific high that shifts towards North Cal California offshore air that's warm and dry, there's strong coastal surface winds, high stability and increased subsidence. So we've, I, we believe we're just scratching the surface of sort of the nature of these clearings. And there's a lot more to be learned <clears throat> about them. So I just wanted to share a little bit about that with you today. So now I'm going to transition to the last topic, which is work we we're doing now off the eastern coast of the United States as part of the ActiveAge campaign. And Activate sort of came about to address limitations that we've had in past campaigns, such as with the Twin Otter over the years. You know, the Twin Otter is a pretty small plane. You can't fit everything you want on it to measure everything that's relevant for aerosol cloud meteorology interactions. Also, uh, you know, with 
many of these campaigns, we go to a location and only fly, fly for you know a few weeks at a time. And it's hard to really generate a lot of statistics and to fly in maybe different seasons when the weather is different and you might have different cloud types. Also with a single plane, it's hard to get all the information you need in a column at once. You know, you're relying on one plane to do too much often. So Activate addresses all of these things. Um, and the, the concept here is to use two planes that fly basically in coordination, in, in synchrony in the column. They fly together. Uh, where the top plane, the King Air, has a polarimeter and the HSRL2 LIDAR. So it looks down and gives all this great information about aerosol and cloud properties. And it also launches drop zones. And this is, of course, in collaboration with the team at NCAR. Um, these drop zones have been critical for everything we've been doing. Um, and, so we get the vertical profile of state parameters. And then with the Falcon, it flies in the boundary layer doing the nitty gritty in situ measurements of gases, aerosols, cloud properties, and weather parameters. It's based out of NASA Langley um, in Hampton, Virginia. And so basing the mission where the planes normally are and where basically all the operations crew is saves resources to do more and more flights. Okay, this would be in contrast to having to base in another continent where you just lose a lot of money right off the bat, but basing locally saves money to do more flights and sort of the, the, the big goal of Activate is build statistics, build statistics. So that's the goal here, do lots and lots of flights. And in the next slide, I'll talk about why this region of the Northwest Atlantic is beneficial for aerosol cloud um, research. So we have publicly available data already from our first year of flights, which were um, conducted in 2020. Um, we, we, are about, we are starting our third year of flights. We actually started last week, and we're going to fly almost continuously from basically last week to the end of June. Okay, so the goal um, at the beginning was 150 joint flights across three years, and we fly in the winter season and the summer season each year. So we're capturing two times of the year where the weather is different and aerosol types are different, which is important for us. Um, we'd really love to grow the science team and people interested in the data. So if anyone's interested in what we're doing, I encourage you to visit our website or contact me. It's, it's really great data if you're interested in you know, anything related to aerosols, clouds, gases off the coast of uh, the east, uh, U.S. East Coast. So... One thing I wanted to do before Activate started was do a homework assignment, which was learn what has been done, you know, over the Northwest Atlantic and including the U.S. East Coast. Uh, so I, I, what I did is I tried to find any publication related to atmospheric sciences research, not just about aerosols, but really anything. And so I, I actually have a timeline here of all the field campaigns I could find on record in the literature. There's been about 50 campaigns done, over 715 papers. And I divided these papers into different subcategories. And the most common topic investigated is just things about aerosols, the properties. And it's been a really rich region to do this type of work because a lot of people are interested in the aging and the outflow of, of the urban emissions from the US East Coast. The least studied topic was aerosol cloud interactions. And of those 24 papers at the time, very few were based on airborne data. And if at all, they were based on maybe one or two case flights. So there's, a, although this region has been studied a lot, not much has been done in the aerosol cloud arena, which is something, uh, a hole we're trying to plug now. It's a region that has a wide dynamic range, as I show down here in aerosol and weather conditions. So depending on the season, you might have smoke, dust, um, urban outflow, um, you get a whole mix of these things, which is great. And uh, the weather changes. Um, in the winter, especially, there's interest in these cold air outbreak events where you have this cold Arctic air that goes over the warmer ocean temperatures leading to these cloud streets of shallow cumulus clouds, which are not handled well currently by models. So we have a lot of interest in improving treatment of these uh, shallow cumulus clouds. So uh, this is a summary on the top left of sort of our flights in the first two years. We've done 93 of them. And as of today, we did our, we, we did our 96th joint flight and uh, these are about four hour flights. Uh, they're out and back flights. And these two black dots represent um, the challenges we have with air traffic control. We are pretty restricted on the way out to those black dots. And then from there, we can really go in um, a, a wide variety of directions. So those are our pivot points basically. 
Initially, we wanted to fly out to Bermuda to extend our spatial range and get away from some of the coastal continental um, uh, influences, but COVID sidelined those plans, but we're actually trying to do that in our third year and maybe even base there in the month of June for an intensive period of time. So here I show you on the top right, sort of the, the flight concept. We fly in a very disciplined approach. We do this routinely and we don't steer away from this, this classic idea. So we fly in what we call cloud ensembles, where again, the King Air kind of flies level at about eight to 10 kilometers, looking down again with the remote sensors dropping drops on. But directly below it, and we try to keep them as coordinated as possible. It's, it's not easy, but we do our best. The Falcon flies below in and above the clouds, as I show here. We do these series of legs. And as I note down here in the bullet, a uh, video will illustrate this the best, which I'll, I'm about to show you. Uh, when we have cloud-free conditions, we do fewer legs, and we just keep repeating these ensembles over and over and over. So what I'm going to do is stop sharing uh, my screen, and then I'm going to go pull up a video to show you. And um, so here, I, have, I will start the video when we're about to start an ensemble. Okay, so we've taken off from Hampton, Virginia, and we're about to approach the cloud. So we're doing a below cloud base leg. Now we're doing above cloud base. Then we go back down for below cloud base leg. Then we come up again for an above cloud base leg. Then we go down as low as we can go to what we call the minimum altitude leg at about 150 meters above the water. And then after that, we do a slant profile to the above cloud top region. We fly there for a little bit, and then we come right below the cloud for what we call the below cloud top lake. Okay, and all the while, so this is a video from the Falcon doing all the in situ measurements in the boundary layer. All the while, the King Air is somewhere above it, looking down with the polarimeters and launching the drop zones. So, that's kind of how we do that. I'm going to go back to my slides now. Okay, so uh, let me continue. I wanted to just um, wrap up with some selected results uh, from the Activate campaign so far from our first couple years of flights. The results I'll show you are just based on the first year of flights, which are publicly available. The second year of flights will be publicly available sometime in mid-January. So um, <clears throat> this is uh, work being led by Rich Farrar and NASA Langley. Um, this, these are results from the HSRL2 LIDAR instrument. This is a case flight on March 8th, 2020. And you can see here on the top left, a vertical curtain of a parameter called aerosol depolarization. Aerosol depolarization, if you're not familiar with it, if it's a high value, it indicates that there's non-spherical particles. Surprisingly, we learn when we started doing these flights, there's enhanced dipole values in the lower parts of the marine boundary layer, which kind of is a head scratcher because usually the species, uh, the particle type that leads to this phenomenon is dust. And so there should be no dust in this region. So the beauty of having the second plane that's flying in the boundary layer at the same time, the Falcon is we, we're getting great measurements of parameters like relative humidity. So here on the right, plot, you can see that uh, the altitude trace of the Falcon colored by relative humidity, and it was very dry in the boundary layer. This is characteristic of cold air outbreaks, as we've learned, and this has been known already. And when it's dry, those of you more familiar with um, aerosol thermodynamics, sea salt does not deliquesce and become a spherical particle. It sort of retains its native um, non-spherical shape. This is a really important finding. Um, other instruments on the Falcon can help confirm there was no dust and most likely it was uh, enriched with sea salt. So again, without the two planes, we couldn't have confirmed all these various things. The reason this is an important finding is that this has implications for satellite remote sensing and aerosol typing. Because when there's enhanced depolarization, it's usually assumed that there's dust. And so that's an incorrect assumption, which can lead to incorrect values of aerosol optical thickness and vertical profiles of aerosol extinction. So this is one of the important new findings. Um, now, this is a, an example of why the drops on data from the, um, that we're doing in collaboration with the NCAR group is so important. So just up here, some fun facts. We've already dropped some 420. As of today, maybe about a 430. And we have about 800 total drops on. So we're going to be dropping a lot from now to the end of June. 
But uh, this is an example of why the drops on data were helpful in this particular study. Uh, here we can sort of show that the, the enhanced aerosol depolarization values are again consistent with reduced uh, values of relative humidity as confirmed by the dropsons in the lower part of the marine boundary layer. Um, this is another example of a, a study uh, recently published in GRL relying on the dropson data. Um, this is led by Paquita Zaidemann's group at the University of Miami. Um, her postdoc led this work, uh, Sithala Shelapan. And so they're interested in, of course, this Gulf Stream off the coast of the, the East Coast. It's an important feature that leads to very strong fluxes of um, you know, mass, heat, uh, moisture. And this has important impacts on the development of boundary layer clouds, especially in the wintertime, leading to those shallow cumulus clouds. So model simulations of these clouds have to rely on uh, some initializations and forcings that have to come from coarse reanalysis data. So the question is, how good are these reanalysis data in this region? Uh, and we had the opportunity to do this uh, an assessment using ground truth data from the drop sons and also a buoy that's out here um, somewhere. Um, and sort of the punchline is that, you know, it's not perfect, but the reanalysis data do a pretty darn good job, good enough for, um, uh, you know, sort of initializing these uh, high resolution modeling studies of these uh, marine boundary layer clouds. And so these black dots represent uh, our drops on releases in that first year of flights in 2019 or 2020. Um, so now moving on, uh, I wanna talk a little bit more about a recent finding. Um, this is, I think, about to be accepted in GRL. It's in advanced stages of review. Um, my research scientist, Andrea Corral, um, led this work. And it, a common feature that we observed um, in the winter flights is that there's new particle formation, we believe, above cloud tops. This is just something we see real time in the data. It caught our eyes and we investigated it in detail here. Um, these plots show cumulative distribution functions for a parameter called N3 divided by N10. It's a common ratio looking at the number concentration of particles above three nanometers versus 10 nanometers. Uh, pretty basic measurement done with, if you have a couple CPC instruments. High values of this ratio above one indicate most likely you have new particle formation because where else could these particles have come from between three and 10 nanometers? So in the winter time, there just systematically are higher values of this ratio and they're most pronounced, uh, the, the, the most prevalence of these high ratios is in what we call the ACT legs, the above cloud top legs. It's shown here in red. So we concluded that there's, uh, quite frequent NPF going on off the East Coast, um, especially in the winter time. Um, it's most pronounced above cloud top, regardless of season, which might be insisted in part by these actinic fluxes that um, are uh, that these cloud tops help uh, provide. Other common features during these NPF events is that there's cold and dry air, and there's continental outflow, which is enriched with you know precursors like probably SO2. So this is a, um, something that we're, we are just introducing and we'd like to probe in more detail um, in future studies. This is an example of why having the two planes together is so nice. Um, in the summer of uh, the first year of flights and even the second year of flights, it's not uncommon to be sampling smoke plumes. And we've traced these smoke plumes to the Western US. Um, so this is just a case flight um, in the summer of 2020 where with the HSRL2, we get these curtains real time that show where you have this enhanced aerosol extinction. So here we see it right here. It's very clear. And it's um, if you can see where my cursor is, the smoke plumes, um, they're actually at different vertical layers, but the strongest one here, it's interacting with the cloud tops of the clouds we're interested in, these marine boundary layer clouds. So real time, the flight scientists on the King Air they can look at this data and tell the flight scientists on the Falcon, hey, instead of flying at your current altitude, you may want to pop up to about 2.4 kilometers where there's the meat of the smoke plume. And so we can do that real time, which is quite nice because then we could go characterize the properties of the smoke plume and the clouds being perturbed by the smoke. So this is an initial study uh, led by my recently graduated PhD student, Ali Maradi, looking at um, how common smoke plumes are on the East Coast in the Northwest Atlantic. And he profiled this case flight in that study. 
And one of the last things I, I want to show is um, a study looking at the relationships between cloud drop number concentration and aerosol in the activate region. This is a very busy uh, figure, but I, the point of it is just to have you focus on this black trace here in the second panel. The black trace is the number of concentration of droplets as measured by an FCDP instrument. So right offshore, we're seeing values above 1200 per cubic centimeter. That's a very high number. And not too far away offshore, the numbers plummet to about 100. Big gradients, okay, this is common in this region. So we're, we're really interested in this really important parameter, cloud drop number concentration, and what are the factors that are best related to it? This is work recently published in ACP by uh, my now postdoc, former student, Hossein Dada Shazar. So uh, one thing that we've seen, uh, it's crystal clear in the satellite data, reanalysis data, is there's an opposite cycle across the year in drop number concentration versus aerosol proxies like AOD. And uh, so the question is why? Um, and so our, all of our analysis um, in, in Hossein's study indicated that there's just simply stronger aerosol cloud interactions in the winter season, which lead to the higher drop number concentrations, even though you have less aerosol. And so conditions that um, are consistent with the highest drop number concentration days include having continental outflow, which is um, usually enhanced with sulfate, which is, it's a very hygroscopic species, good for CCN activity. And also in the winter time, there's those strong surface fluxes, again, um, um, and it's very common during cold air outbreaks. These strong fluxes give rise to a lot of updrafts, which help fuel the activation of particles into drops. So even though there's more aerosol in the summer, you can convert a lot more of those particles into droplets in the winter time. And so this is not, uh, this study was not too focused on aircraft data because we're, we're still building the data set, but um, we'd like to probe these types of issues a little bit more in the, in the coming years. As I said earlier in the talk, I'm gonna circle back to that golden flight. So since that first flight, we've done a number of campaigns and I've always been so interested in oxalate, the species, because my whole PhD was surrounded that species. Uh, so a lot of folks have been using this relationship between oxalate and sulfate. And when they're correlated, usually the conclusion is, oh, there was cloud processing involved in that air mass. So what we decided to do is look at all these various campaigns shown in these boxes that some of you may or may not be familiar with um, and to see what is the val characteristic value of the ratio we see in these campaigns. And so there's actually a pretty consistent tight range that we see, regardless of where the campaigns were, um, which is quite interesting. Uh, the 95% confidence interval of this ratio is, you know, as you can see here, it's in this range. Typical value is about 0.02. Um, so it's, it's pretty interesting. And we see that this ratio gets higher if two things happen. One is if you have biomass burning, there's just simply a lot more oxalate relative to sulfate as what's normally in the air. And then two, if there's coarse aerosol present, and we saw a lot of this during the Campex campaign in Southeast Asia, where there was a lot of dust, again, entrained like we believe in the smoke plumes and just simply dust plumes. So if you have dust or smoke, the ratio is higher, but in the absence of those two, we believe this ratio can be quite useful for some back of the envelope calculations if someone's interested in the amount of SOA production with aqueous processing, because sulfate is a lot better constrained. So if you know the sulfate, you can say something about oxalate now if you use this ratio. We also did ground-based measurements across 16 months, um, weekly Moody measurements in, in Metro Manila. This is part of a Campex collaboration we had. And we saw that this ratio is still robust, even in the surface uh, layer. Um, so the dashed lines here are that 95% confidence interval. And our measurements, when you don't have smoke on the left panel, below one micron show that you're in that range. And then as soon as you get above one micron in the coarse range, the, the ratios tend to be higher. And on the right is when you have biomass burning, again, the ratios are higher. So this was just accepted into GRL by uh, my graduate student, Miguel Hilario, who's actually from the Manila Observatory. And this is where I wanna finish. Um, uh, we, we've had a great collaboration in, through Campex with this team at Manila Observatory. And one of those students who's now one of my PhD students is Jenny Lorenzo, who has the honor of being, um, uh, received the Ralph Cicerone Fellowship to work with the ACON, ACON team, specifically Mary Barth. So we're, we're grateful for that um, honor for her. And, um, 
lastly, I just want to say thank you. This is a picture from uh, Brian Matt, Tucson, Arizona. So that's it. Well, thank you, Armin, for a comprehensive overview of um, the aerosol cloud interactions due to all these myriads of forcings, anthropogenic and natural. So as you know, EOL has a focus on um, atmospheric measurement systems that capture snapshots of what we're measuring in the field. So it's really interesting to hear um, of these grand multi-year repeat measurements over regional scales and how you and your group um, gather all of that information and interpret it. Uh, that's, um, that's impressive. Um, so audience, we have time for questions. Again, please use the Slido interface below the presentation screen, you scroll down. Um, so because this is a, a virtual seminar and it's rather one-sided, I'm hoping that audience members are judiciously crafting and typing questions on Slido uh, for, uh, for our esteemed uh, speaker, Armin, Dr. Armin Sarushian. And while we are waiting for questions, uh, can I ask a question? So I see that you're measuring a number, I see that you were measuring a number of um, chemical species in the aerosols that you were collecting. And that made me think of pH. Does, does the pH of the CCN like affect cloud growth or decay or even the type of clouds that are formed? Like does a polluted cloud have a particularly high pH or a low pH? That's a, that's a fantastic, uh, intriguing question. So that's not a direct measurement that um, we've done in these campaigns. Um, uh, it's quite a challenging uh, type of measurement. Uh, the, the one time that, well, the, the easiest way to measure pH that we actually do is with our cloud water samples. So, you know, that's easier. You get the liquid sample and vials and you just use the classic pH probe that we all learned about, uh, you know, maybe college chemistry class. Um, and so we've, we've seen a pretty narrow range of cloud water pH um, in these various campaigns. Um, and the one time that it actually gets a little bit higher than normal, like exceeding five would be considered high compared to our samples is when there's dust influence because there's alkaline components um, associated with the dust. And um, it, I, I, uh, presumably the uh, pH will affect a lot of the aqueous chemistry, maybe the pathways of reactions that can occur. And the aerosol phase, I'm, that's not a measurement that we've done. And I would not necessarily be an expert to say what the effect of the aerosol pH would be on the CCN active, activation process. Um, that, now there are some species that have been equated with being more acidic than others, you know, things like sulfates and maybe nitrates, and those are very hygroscopic. So they, they, there, there might be some, there might be something there. And maybe I, it requires some more investigation. That's a, that's a great uh, question that yeah. I would need to think more about. Thank you very much for your response. Um, we have um, a question from Tammy Weck Weckworth. Yeah. And she says, um, thank you for a, a fascinating survey of your research on aerosol cloud interactions. My question is about cloud clearings off the California coast. You show life cycle and diurnal information from satellite imagery. Do your aircraft data give you further clues about why the boundaries are so abrupt? That's a fantastic question. Um, we've done over the years probably a handful of flights. Um, where we did what I kind of showed you, we fly across the interface and then we do our spiral soundings. I wouldn't say that we've built a big enough data set to make robust conclusions. Um, and one of the reasons is these are really hard to get to sometimes within the constraints we have with our three and a half, four hour flights. But what we have learned that we've archived in a couple of the papers I cited in the slides is that there might be different driving mechanisms for when, why the clearings are generated. I think most common is that you have this offshore air that's warm and dry. And that's why a lot of the clearings often are hugging the coast. <coughs> but sometimes the clearing is not touching the coast. It's actually you know, to the west somewhere and they might have a different driving mechanism. So I think the verdict is still, uh, we haven't fully figured out um, you know, what are all the reasons that these are formed? But the question about why is the boundary so abrupt, it is a good one. And I'm shocked myself when I'm actually flying 
through these things because it is so darn distinct, so clear. Um, sometimes there's no transition, it's just right there. Uh, so one thing that we learned from our flight data, and this is documented more in the Crosby et al. 2016 JAS paper, where we did three of these types of flights in the NICE campaign, is that there are evaporatively cooled down drafts right at the, the cloud edge, which sort of accelerate the retrograde er erosion of the cloud edge. Um, so there's these processes that are occurring at a pretty fine scale right at the cloud edge that are helping erode the cloud edge um, during the day to let this clearing expand. Um, and that's based, that's, that data is just based on high resolution wind type of data we get. Um, but that's, it's a great question. And I, I think um, these are important features to study because they are common, they're big, and um, they're a lot more needs to be done. So thank you for that question, Tammy. Thank you. We have um, we have a question from Britt Stevens. Hi, Armin. Thanks for a very nice talk. If you use the King Air to intentionally target biomass burning layers with the Falcon, does that risk biasing the overall statistics? Mm. Uh, great question. Um, so this has happened on maybe one or two out of the 96 flights we've had. So I, I don't think um, we are risking anything with our overall statistics. And um, still, when we chat real time to tell the Falcon where to fly, we're still maintaining our general flight pattern, which is doing those legs in order. Um, so I, I think our statistics are robust no matter what we do. Um, I would say the only times when there would be real-time information to go capture a feature, it would have to be if it's smoke or um, it hasn't happened yet, but we're hopeful this summer, an African dust event. Um, uh, but still, we always stick to our stair-stepping pattern with the Falcon. And um, I think our statistics are still fine. Again, we're, we're super disciplined in this campaign. It's not, it's not really fun. I know a lot of campaigns, there's a lot of creativity and temptation on the fly to go this way or that way, but we are just doing the same thing over and over, literally. So, <laughs> which is meant to be uh, more conducive to data analysis for a wide range of people interested in data. It just makes it easier. Yeah. Thank you, Britt. Um, okay. I have, a, I have a kind of a follow-on question from Britt and, and Tammy that you sort of um, alluded to. So you've been actively involved in field campaigns throughout your career. I mean, that, that's the bulk of your, 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 your career. And you mentioned the complexities and the, po and the positives and negatives of measuring everything that you, you, you can and the constraints to answer your science questions. So if you had an ideal measurement system for your particular cloud aerosol studies, what further sensors or, or in measurements would you like to add? You know, what kind of time scales would be desired? Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic question. So thankfully, uh, our measurements are all mostly one second resolution or better. So I, I think in terms of our, our time resolution, we're, we're doing pretty good. Um, and even with the, the remote sensors like the HSRL2, we get very good vertical resolution in the data. Um, one, the one instrument that we could not fit in the payload, which um, uh, it's really a shame. I mean, the data are still really good, but uh, it, we would have loved to have it as a radar to really get at some more of the details of the cloud behavior, precipitation. Um, we also had wanted to have a, a, a microwave radiometer on the King Air or even the Falcon to look at a parameter liquid water path, which is sort of the column amount of water in a cloud, which is a really important parameter for these aerosol cloud studies. And um, we, we were not successful to secure such an instrument. Um, but those would be the two that I would say we would, I would love to have had. Um, to look at the cloud uh, the properties. So in absence of those, what we have to rely on are, um, you know, the, the research scanning polarimeter from the King Air can provide some information about the water content of a cloud. Um, but uh, liquid water path uh, 
you know, assuming it's not available from the RSP, we have to rely on the Falcon during its slant profiles. And the hope is that when it does these profiles, it's continuously in clouds, which is not the case in this region. It's so complicated where you have a cloud, then no cloud, then no cloud, and then you have a cloud. When you do these profiles, you're in and out of cloud. It just makes it really hard to get um, a, a really robust liquid water path um, calculation. And um, yeah, so that's my long-winded answer. Uh, 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 something to measure liquid water path and uh, a radar. Um, maybe, yeah. for, uh, maybe for the next field campaign, though, that Armin, bigger plane. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, uh, one thing uh, that when, whenever I hear the bigger plane, the one thing that saved us in this really strange time to do airborne field science with COVID is the fact that we had two small planes. Now, that nobody would have predicted when we wrote the proposal, this massive pandemic would hit, which has sidelined many field studies uh, with airplanes. But the fact that there's two small planes and everyone's based at Langley allowed us to actually still fly. Uh, otherwise, I don't know where we'd be at this point. We'd be in, I mean, we have a, we have a good excuse, but um, it's very easy to socially distance on a very small plane. And we don't need a lot of people on the plane to do whatever they need to do. But if we're like on a DC-8, if some of you have been on that plane, there's a lot of people, it would be much harder to fly. So we're kind of saved by the fact that we have these two small planes um, during this strange period. Well, it seems that today was a quiet group. I guess everyone's preparing for AGU, um, and but that could also mean that everyone is just in awe of your presentation. Um, you covered all the bases. Um, we are past the seminar hour. Um, if you're interested in Dr. Armin Sarushian's presentation and have further questions, please reach out to him via his email, which is provided in the seminar flyer. On behalf of NCAR and EOL, I would like to thank Dr. Sarushian on his excellent presentation on cloud aerosol interactions observed from the recent field campaigns. Thank you, everyone, and all the best for the rest of this year. Thank you.